Last time we were together, we were talking about demand and supply. And I mentioned that you need demand and you need supply in order to have a market. Thus far, we've only talked about them separately. In order to have that market, we've got to bring them together, and that's what we're going to do today. So, just to review, we were looking at two, we were looking at the market for Netflix subscriptions, and we had demand and supply. We had a demand table and a supply table separately. Now let's bring those two things together to see how this overall model of demand and supply help us to reach a price in a market. So here are the various prices that we had for our Netflix subscriptions. And so let's put in the quantity demanded and the quantity supplied. So remember at low prices, the quantity demanded was large. So we had 300 subscriptions demanded, 300 million subscriptions demanded at $10. And then from there, we went down The numbers got smaller as the price went up. So the law of demand was telling us as the price goes up from 10 up to 18, quantity demanded would fall. On the supply side, however, we saw that at low prices, the quantity supplied was smaller because businesses need to be able to cover their costs. And that's harder to do at lower prices. But as prices go up, then the quantity supplied rises. That's the law of supply in action. So we've got our quantity demanded and our quantity supplied at these various prices. Now let's take a look at what happens here if the price is very low. So let's say here we're at a price of $10. Look what happens in this situation. Here what we have is a situation where the quantity demanded is 300 and the quantity supplied is 220. Well here, we say that the quantity demanded is greater than the quantity supplied. That's what happens when the price is lower. And in that situation, we have what we could just as easily say would be a shortage. People want Netflix, Netflix subscriptions, but Netflix doesn't have enough server space. It's, it's you know, maybe the, um, they just don't have the ability to produce as many of those, of those things as are being demanded because the price is too low. So when the price is low, we have shortage. In this case, we have a very specific shortage of 80. So if we take the quantity demanded and subtract the quantity supplied, we have a shortage of 80. But this is a sending a signal to Netflix. Netflix says to themselves, wait a minute, people really want our product. And if they really, really want our product, then they should be willing to pay for it. So let's increase the price. Let's take the price from 10 to 12. Well, in this case, quantity demanded is still greater than quantity supplied, but Notice that the difference between the two numbers is getting smaller. So now there's a shortage, but in this case, the shortage is only 40. I took my 280 and I subtracted my 240. The difference is 40. Now, let's see what happens when the price is very high down here. At a price of 18, we have a slightly different situation. Now the quantity demanded is 220 and it is actually less than the quantity supplied. When that's the case, when the quantity demanded is less than the quantity supplied, we have what's called a surplus. Too much is being produced. Netflix has the capabilities of providing 300 million subscriptions, but at that higher price, people are bailing out. They're, they're looking for substitutes. They're cutting the cord. They're just, they're not dealing with um, Netflix as much. In this case, the surplus very specifically is 80. So we'll just make this a plus 80. There's too many, too many things being produced. 
Whereas up here, we had a shortage, put a little minus sign there. There were fewer subscriptions available than people wanted. Now we have too many. Netflix is saying to themselves, uh, this isn't good. We have the ability to produce more, but people aren't buying it. So if we want to sell more subscriptions, we're going to have to lower the price. And so they lower it to 16. In that case, the quantity demanded is still less than the quantity supplied. But now our surplus is smaller. The surplus is 40. It's uh, the difference between the quantity demanded and the quantity supplied. That leaves us with one price option here at 14, where the quantity demanded and the quantity supplied are equal to each other. And that condition is known as equilibrium. In equilibrium, we say that the market clears. Because there's no surplus and there's no shortage. There's exactly the amount available that people want to, to purchase at that particular price. Equilibrium is where the market is trying to get. That's, that's where the market wants to be. It's sort of this, um, this movement that occurs and the market prefers equilibrium because there aren't any shortages and there aren't any surpluses. Sometimes we refer to this movement toward equilibrium as there being a, an invisible hand that forces the market this way. The invisible hand was an idea that was uh, presented originally by a, a guy named Adam Smith. Adam Smith is sort of the, you can think of him almost as the godfather of economics. He's, he's where things get started. In fact, the idea of comparative advantage that we talked about was sort of uh, incubated with Adam Smith. And we'll talk more about Adam Smith later in the, in the course. Adam Smith's idea of the invisible hand is found in this um, incredibly long, yet incredibly readable work of his called the, um, the Wealth of Nations. That's what we, we refer to it as now anyway, The Wealth of Nations. It was published in 1776, a date which you probably have kind of rings a bell for you. Um, in Europe, this was the best-selling book of the year, really. Uh, not too many people were paying attention to what was going on between these you know, upstart British colonists and, uh, and Great Britain. They were busy at home reading The Wealth of Nations, reading about how economies were supposed to work. One of the things Smith talked about, again, is this idea of the invisible hand, that, that whenever sellers and buyers get together, there's this force that, that moves us to a, a mutually beneficial price. It doesn't really matter what the attitude of the seller is or the attitude of the buyer is. They both want to be made better off. And so while the buyer would like a lower price and the seller would like to sell at a higher price, this invisible hand pushes people toward a price where they're both going to actually be made better off because there will be a transaction. The buyer may refuse to buy at a really high price, and the seller may refuse to sell at a really low price. And if that's the case, neither side is made better off. There's no transaction. There's no well-being generated for either side. Instead, there's this invisible hand, this, this thing that, that forces the sides to negotiate. The buyer is ready to walk out of a store and before that happens, the invisible hand says, now come on, be reasonable. Let's, let's, let's move you in this direction. You know, pay a little bit higher price. And the seller may be refusing to sell at that really low price. They want to sell at a super high price and the invisible hand saying, come on now, let's, let's, don't be silly here. If you don't lower your price, you're not going to make a sale. Smith talks about this in the context of a butcher. So the butcher wants to sell the product and, and they treat the customer 
better than maybe the butcher would normally treat a customer because he knows there's competition. He knows the customer could go elsewhere. And so the, the butcher lowers their price to satisfy the customer. And the customer, they'll, take a, they'll pay a little bit higher price just to make sure that they get the cut of meat that they want. And so there's this meeting in the middle. The invisible hand pushes sometimes obstinate trading partners together so that they both can be made better off. And that's what's going on in a market. That's how markets reach this equilibrium price. If the price is too high, there are lots of people who won't buy the product and the seller ends up with a surplus. If the price is too low, there's lots of buyers who can't get the product and there's a shortage. So the price comes up and the price comes down until we, we sort of meet in the middle. That's what it looks like in a, in a table of data. Let's see what it looks like in a graph when we put these two things together. We're going to put the demand curve and the supply curve in the same space. Okay, so here's our space. Here's quantity and price. And here's our demand curve, our downward sloping demand curve. And here's our supply curve, upward sloping. And you probably already see what's going to happen here. But before we get there, let me just put in a couple of prices that we know aren't going to work. Here's our high price of 18. And at 18, if you come across to the demand curve, we know that that point is the 220 units. But if we keep going across to our supply curve, we know at that really high price, supply is 300. That's what would be the number if we drop down here. There's 300. And if we drop down here, that's our 220. And the gap between these two, that is our surplus. Clearly, you can see that there's going to be more supply than demand at that high price. This is not going to, it's not good for the seller. It's really not good for the buyer because there are lots of people who just leave this market. They're like, I'm not going to pay that much. Now, if the price was down here at $10, there is our quantity supplied. That's our 220 now. And our quantity demanded out here was 300. In this case, this is our shortage. That gap shows us the people who want to buy this, uh, the Netflix subscriptions, but can't get them, they're just not available. The invisible hand says, all right, if your price is too high, you gotta lower that price. And when the price goes down, we move along the demand curve and supply curves. And if the price is too low, the invisible hand says, come on, let's raise the price. So we move along the supply curve and we move along the demand curve until we get to that point right there where X marks the spot, our equilibrium point, where we have a price of $14 and a quantity of 260. That's our equilibrium. This is where the market is trying to go. It wants to clear. It wants to stay in this steady state of equilibrium. Now, before we take a look at a couple of uh, other examples, I want to take, uh, I just want to note one last thing about kind of market basics here. If you remember when we were talking about demand and supply, we mentioned this, this idea of producer surplus and consumer surplus. In a market setting, when we reach equilibrium, 
what we're doing is we're finding that price that clears the market, but we're also doing something else. I mentioned the idea of the notion of equity and how markets aren't always equal. And clearly not. There are people who want to buy things who can't get them because they won't pay that price. They won't pay the price set by the market. But markets do have the distinct advantage of being efficient. So we talked about the idea of producer and consumer surpluses, and let me draw those in here as well. Remember, the consumer surplus is this area below the demand curve and above the price. Let's label that CS for consumer surplus. The producer surplus is the area below the price and above the supply curve. So that's this area here. And we'll label that as PS for producer surplus. What the market is doing when it reaches equilibrium is that it is maximizing these combined surpluses. Consumer surplus plus producer surplus equals the total surplus that's created by the market. In economics, sometimes we refer to this as total welfare. Now, this type of welfare has nothing to do with a government program. All we're talking about in terms of total welfare is the well-being to the to the participants in the market. And in this case, we are maximizing the total surplus, the total welfare of society by getting to equilibrium. And let me show you what happens if we don't get to equilibrium. Let's say, um, for instance, let's say that the price is too high. So let's say that our price is up here, just a little bit above equilibrium, not a, not a lot above. But if we do that, if we have that price, then the quantity demanded will be on the demand curve right here. Now, of course, the quantity supplied will be greater, but that doesn't matter because the amount that's bought and sold is going to be the smaller amount. The amount that's bought and sold will be this quantity here. I'm just gonna mark it with, a, with a, this purple X. So there is surplus that could have been generated if we were out here, but we're not. We're at the X, which means that, I'm going to shade this in, this area here, this amount of total surplus, some of it is uh, producer surplus and some of it is consumer surplus, but this purple triangle here, it doesn't get created. There's, in other words, there's less total surplus if the price is too high. And the same logic applies here if the price is too low. So let's do this. Let's return to the pre... Let's return to the price at equilibrium. Okay, so here we are at equilibrium. Let's say that instead of the price being higher than equilibrium, the price is lower than equilibrium right here. So we'll go across to our supply curve. That's the first curve we hit. Now there is greater quantity demanded out here, but that doesn't matter. Those people who want the product can't get it at the low prices because there's not as much available. So once again, we're at the X. That's the quantity in the market at the low price, which means there is this area that could have been total welfare. It could have been value to the overall society, but it doesn't get created. The point here is that at only at equilibrium, that's the only point where the total surplus, the total welfare of society is maximized. Otherwise, we lose something if the price is too low or the price is too high. And markets want to be in equilibrium in part because it clears the market, but also in part because it generates the most well-being for the overall society when we are at equilibrium. So those are the mechanisms of the market. We're going to take a look at 
at that market and how it works and what happens when we move out of equilibrium or what might cause us to move out of equilibrium here in just a minute. But before we do that, I want to take a look at a couple of other examples of shortages and surpluses just to make sure that you're, um, you're comfortable with those ideas. The first of our examples is, is this. Let me give you a little bit of background here. This is a, a, a dump in the deserts of Nevada. A long, long time ago, before PlayStations and Switches and all these other gaming systems, the dominant gaming system was the Atari 2600, uh, a fabulous game system of, that played very simple games where you needed one button and maybe a joystick. And the games were very pixelated. They were like very rudimentary uh, Minecraft types of games. And in the early 1980s, Atari was sitting at the top of the world of gaming. And the movie E.T. came out. And E.T. was a box office sensation. So it just made sense for the makers of E.T. and the makers of Atari to get together and develop a game. Unfortunately, they didn't have a whole lot of time to produce the game. And, and as you might imagine, the game they produced was actually rather horrible. There wasn't much going on there. As a result, not many people wanted this game. Atari produced a huge amount of games that nobody wanted. In fact, they couldn't lower the price really low enough to sell them. So the legend has it that they, in the dark of night, dug a big hole in the desert and threw a bunch of these games in. And then a few years ago, after this rumor, this urban legend has been developed over time, a couple of intrepid gamers went out into the desert to see if they could find the big hole into which the Atari games were dumped, and lo and behold, they found it. They found thousands and thousands of, of E.T. games, and they actually found a few that still worked, and they realized that the game really was as bad as advertised. So what does that have to do with, with what we've just been talking about? Well, here's the market for Atari E.T. games, and the market should be at P1. That's where the price would clear. Even for these bad games, they could have cleared the market, but that's not what happened. Instead, the price was up here. The price was here at this solid blue line. And you see there, if the price goes up, we move along the demand curve. And the quantity demanded is less than the quantity supplied. Atari's producing all of these games way out here. But they're not selling anything. And they're not selling as much. They sold some because of the early enthusiasm for the game. Here we have the situation where the quantity demanded is less than the quantity supplied. And we have a surplus. And basically what you want to do with the surplus, if you don't lower the prices, you just got to blow up a whole bunch of stuff or dump it in a hole in the desert. That's a surplus. And to get rid of that surplus, as we already talked about, you've got to lower the price. Now, on the other hand, we can look at a market for, for nurses. And the discussion in this labor market for nurses is that there's a shortage of nurses. And I can get rid of the shortage of nurses in a heartbeat. Here's the market. And the problem in the market for nurses is that the price is too low. The price in this case would be the wage. So in labor markets, we call the price something a little bit different. We call it the wage. And for nurses, the wage is too low. I know it's too low because there's a nursing shortage. At this low wage, the quantity supplied of nurses is down here. At this dot right here. The quantity demanded, the quantity demanded is way over here. So here's our quantity demanded. This is the classic example of a shortage. We have shortages of nurses because the wage is too low. If we want to eliminate the shortage, and if you're out there being a nursing major, you might be starting to applaud at this. We want to eliminate that shortage. We have to raise the wage. We have to pay people more. We have to give them an incentive to move into this industry. So if we want to get rid of that nursing shortage, raise the price you pay. Because we can see here that the price we pay 
should be at P1. That's what the equilibrium price should be. So you want to get rid of the shortage. You want to move people up the supply curve. You've got to raise the price. Now that's going to reduce the quantity demanded, but it's going to increase the quantity supplied till we get to this equilibrium point. That's how you fix shortages. And you fix sur surpluses by reducing the price. But it is incredibly important to understand and, and differentiate these two ideas that we've been talking about. Shortages are not the same thing. A shortage is not scarcity. They are not the same. Scarcity always exists. We can't get away from it. Shortages are always a phenomenon of price, where price is too low. These are not the same ideas. And unfortunately, sometimes people equate them. They think we can get rid of scarcity by changing the price, and that's not correct. You can't get rid of scarcity. You can just help people deal with it better. You can get rid of shortages. It means raising the price, and not everybody wants to do that. Here's one last example of this. Um, maybe over the, um, over the summer, you got uh, Disney Plus. And on Disney Plus, they replayed Hamilton, the musical. Hamilton was this, um, a nice, it still is, this phenomenon for, for people who enjoy musicals, for people who enjoy history that, that nobody's really ever seen before. And one of the things that Hamilton did, especially on Broadway, was it created these markets where the prices for tickets were just astronomical. People could not get tickets to this show unless they were willing to pay hundreds and in some cases thousands of dollars over face value. This is clearly a market where prices were not set appropriately. One of uh, my daughter's friends won the Hamilton lottery in uh, for the show on Broadway, which meant they won the right to buy eight tickets at face value. The face value is anywhere between about $400 and $120. So $120 is still a lot of money to pay for a, for a musical ticket, but if you could get tickets at face value, it was, it was just very, very unusual. Now, my daughter's friend had five members of their family, and they won the right to buy eight tickets. So they called up my daughter and asked if she would be interested in buying these tickets. And my wife, of course, was said, yes, absolutely, we'll take three. Which would have been fine, but we have five people in our family. So in order for everybody to go, we had to buy two tickets on the secondary market. So I went to the secondary market, and this, this was after the, the original cast had, had come and gone. So the prices weren't quite as high, but these were the prices I was looking at. Between, you can see a low of $349 and a, and a high of $545. And I thought to myself, I don't think anybody here won the lottery. I think we're being duped. But... Everybody wanted to go to the show, so I had to buy two extra tickets on the secondary market. Now, I bring all this up not to, not to brag that we went to see Hamilton on Broadway. It was fun. It was fine. But I want to talk about the economics of this because it makes no sense. With that many people wanting to buy tickets, Lin-Manuel Miranda and the people who were running Hamilton made a horrible pricing decision. What they should have done was paid attention to the economics because here is where their prices were, down here. But equilibrium was much higher. I know equilibrium was higher because if you go to the secondary market, these tickets were selling out at these high prices. And the Hamilton folks get these prices. They get the, the face value tickets, $120 and, and up. But on the secondary markets, they don't make extra money. This amount of money, this extra price, these you know $420 tickets, that extra $300 goes into the pocket of the scalpers. It goes Part of it goes into the pocket of the scalpers the people selling tickets above face value. Part of it goes to the, the, the websites, whether it's SeatGeek or uh, StubHub. And the Hamilton people go home with their 120 when they could go home with a lot more. 
this is just a misunderstanding of the economics. When you have a high demand, and a, in, in the case of Hamilton, a very limited supply, you should raise your prices. Don't let other people make money on your hard work. But there's a lot of people in the entertainment industry that, that just don't seem to get that. So by now, I hope that you're getting used to these ideas of demand and supply and equilibrium. But unfortunately, well, it's not unfortunate, it's just reality. The world doesn't stay in equilibrium all the time. Instead, we start to see things change. And what we're going to look at now is how we can use this model to predict the future, to basically magic eight ball this so that we can understand why markets change and why prices go up and down. It's a process that we call comparative statics. Comparative statics is comparing two static states of the world. So once there is a change in our markets, we use the demand and supply model to predict the future, to predict what's going to happen to price, and to the quantity that's bought and sold in the market. Okay, we're going to begin our application of our demand and supply model by looking at oil prices. And consequently, we're gonna look at gas, the market for gasoline. Oil is needed for gasoline, and as the oil market changes, so does the gasoline market. So we can sort of call these two things basically the same. This, these are prices for a barrel of oil from 2010 to the present. And you can see here in early 2010, a barrel of oil was $78.22. There's a little spike here and then a, kind of a, an upward move. And then in the early, uh, you know, the first half of 2011, the price had risen to $110 a barrel. And it kind of bounces around in this uh, you know, 90 to $95 range. And then we see a big drop in the price of oil. And then we see another little drop here in 2016. But when we get out here to 2020, we see an enormous drop. At the end of 2019, oil was just under $60 a barrel. And then it falls off a cliff. And in April, you could buy a barrel of oil for $16.5 a barrel. That is so remarkably low for the price of a barrel of oil that it makes us ask the question, what's going on here? Now, I don't think I have to tell any of you that over the last few months, things have been a little bit unusual. And we should be able to take that information, that unusualness, and insert it into a demand and supply model and be able to understand why that changes the price, why this big drop occurred shouldn't be a mystery at all. So let's explore that. So here we have our market, specifically the market for gasoline. We need to know what we're talking about. What is the demand and supply for? And so we're looking at the market for gasoline. Where the two lines cross, right here, we have our equilibrium price. I'm just going to label that as P1 just to give us a starting point. It's not always necessary to have a specific price, but you do want to know what direction things are moving. So we'll start off with P1, and our equilibrium quantity will be Q1. Now, Sometimes students ask here, is this the quantity demanded or the quantity supplied? And the answer is it's both. Because at this point right here, at equilibrium, there is a demand curve and a supply curve. So this, could, this will be the price and quantity demanded, but it is also the price and quantity supplied. So rather than to say this is the quantity demanded and quantity supplied, which is sort of a mouthful, we say that this is the market quantity or the equilibrium quantity. You can say either one. Uh, so rather than say quantity demanded or quantity supplied, we're just interested in the equilibrium point here. So now we need to know what the situation is. What, what's the, the cause of a change? The situation, of course, was COVID and COVID-19 and the shutting down of economies. When people are told to basically stay home, don't leave the house, what do you think that's going to do to the market for gasoline? Is that going to affect the buyer's side of the equation or the seller's side of the equation? 
Well, because people aren't driving and they aren't using gasoline, the answer here is the demand side. Now let's use our comparative statics to see what happens to this market. The process of using comparative statics is three simple steps. The first thing you need to do is to determine, based on this situation, which curve is going to shift. Secondly, you need to know which direction it's going to shift. And thirdly, you compare the price and the quantity, the new price to the old one and the new quantity to the old one. So, we already said that this is going to affect demand. It's going to affect demand because people are using this product less. So we know the demand curve shifts. And if people are using the product less, then it's going to shift the demand curve to the left. It's going to decrease demand. Which of the demand shifters would this be? Well, it could be actually a number of them. It could be a change in tastes. It could be a change in the number of buyers. Regardless, it's going to shift demand to the left. And so we're going to move from our original D demand curve at D to our new demand curve, D2. Since we move demand, we could, we could sort of think about this. We could almost say that this demand curve here, this one just basically doesn't count anymore. We'll get rid of that one. And now we have a new equilibrium point here, which will give us our new price, P2, and our new quantity, Q2. So now we've completed the first two steps of our comparative statics. We've decided which curve shifts demand, and which direction does it shift? It shifts to the left, it goes in this direction. Now the last thing we need to do is compare what has happened to price and quantity. So what's happened to price? Price has very clearly gone down. Price has fallen, it goes from P1 to P2. And that's what we saw in the gasoline market. We saw that the prices of gasoline went down. In some cases, they went down a lot. And we also see in this market that the quantity of gasoline being bought and sold went down a lot. There were no lines anywhere for gasoline. There were, in fact, some gas stations didn't see customers, more than a handful of customers any, in any one day because people simply weren't driving. They didn't need to use gasoline. So that's comparative statics. We find out which curve, based on a situation, just one situation, we find out which curve shifts, which direction does it shift, and then we compare the new state of the world, the new static state of the world. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, there's a lot of other things going on in the world, in the gasoline market, other than just this. And that would be true. That would be absolutely correct. But we want to hold all else constant. Remember those paper airplanes when we started messing around with too many things? We weren't sure what the cause of the change in the flight path was. And the same thing applies here. If we change too many curves at once, we don't know what's the cause. We can't identify the cause. So we're just going to change one thing at a time. So that's one example. Let's take a look at another example. What happens to the market for beer if the availability of aluminum cans falls? We're going to follow the same process here. We're going to look at which curve shifts, which direction does it shift, and then what happens to price and quantity. That's our comparative statics. And this is another situation that we find ourselves in, at least at this current time, where aluminum is aluminum cans are sort of in short supply. So we're going to do the same thing here to conduct our comparative static analysis. Here's our original market, and the market is the market for beer. We start off with our original equilibrium. Again, we'll call this P1. And then here's Q1, our market quantity and market price. Now the situation, well here we have a situation that's a change in the, in the, in the availability of inputs. You need cans when you're selling beer, at least some beers. Now we run through our comparative statics. First of all, which curve is going to shift? Which one do you think? Is it something that affects demand or is this something that affects supply? Well, of course, it's something that affects supply. It affects the ability of producers to get beer to the market. So 
which curve shifts its supply, and which direction does it shift? Well, it's going to decrease or a shift to the left. Now, this is a shift. This is uh, shifting supply is where shifting curves to the left and right rather than up and down is really, really important. Remember, a shift to the left looks like this. That's a decrease in supply. Even though it looks like the curve itself is moving up, we need to think about it in terms of left and right being decreases and increases. So here we've decreased supply. We've moved it from S to S2. Our new equilibrium point is right here. So here's P2 and here's Q2. So which curve shifts? Its supply, it shifts to the left, it's a decrease, so that's the direction. And now we compare our new equilibrium. So what should we expect to see in the beer market? We should expect prices to go up because one of those inputs is now more, uh, is less available. And we should expect the amount of beer bought and sold to actually go down. Now this might have an impact on other markets. It might mean that people buy more hard alcohol. It might be that people buy more wine. It might be that people buy more home beer brewing kits. It might mean that um, people go to other extremes to get things um, that induce a similar feel to beer. This is what we expect to see happen in the beer market because of the change in the availability of aluminum. So using the demand and supply model can help us make predictions. And usually the predictions are pretty accurate. The key is you've got to make sure you choose the proper curve and move it in the proper direction. Because just imagine if we would have said, oh, we're going to shift supply and we're going to shift it here. That would have told us that we would expect prices to go down and more beer to be bought and sold. But that's probably not what's going to happen. Okay, so that's the demand and supply model. If you start to move both curves, things get a little bit trickier. And you can take a look at that material in the book. What I want to do now to wrap up demand and supply is to talk about a, uh, I guess, a little bit more advanced concept in demand and supply, something we call elasticity. Elasticity refers to how much of a change we should expect. Currently, we've just been looking at whether the demand curve shifts, the supply curve shifts, and what happens to price and quantity as a result. And that's important stuff, don't get me wrong. It's, it's good to know which direction things are moving. But elasticity talks more about how responsive people are to changes. What is the um, intensity of the change when it occurs? To do that, we need to use a little bit of math. Now, the math we're going to use is pretty simple. It is uh, mainly just basic division. But it, the math helps us to understand intensity. So let's work through just a couple of problems here and, and explain a little bit more about this concept of elasticity and why it's kind of important. So there are different kinds of elasticity. We're just going to focus our attention on elasticity of demand. This is the most common elasticity. And what this is telling us is how responsive buyers are to a change in price. How responsive are buyers to a change in price? So we know that if the price goes up, we know that quantity demanded is going to go down. What elasticity will tell us is by how much. What is the intensity of reaction? Do people see price go up and just you know, basically run screaming from the doors for the doors and buy nothing? Or do people see prices go up and say, well, yeah, I'm still going to buy what I have to buy? Elasticity tells us that. And this is vital information for companies. They need to know what happens if we raise our prices. Are we going to lose all of our customers? Or are we perhaps going to actually make more money if we raise our prices, even though we'll lose a few of our customers?
Elasticity can tell you that. I haven't met that many billionaires in my life, but I have met one. And it just so happened that that billionaire was an econ major. So I asked him, what was the one thing that you learned as an economics major that you take over into your business? He was in, in, um, in major retail. And he said, well, there was this one concept that, um, that basically said, if you change your price, people react to it. And I said, oh, that's elasticity. And he said, oh, yeah, maybe that's what it was called. I, I don't remember. And that, so that was a little disheartening to say that this econ major forgot about this term, elasticity. But it also was a great illustration or a great um, application of this concept of elasticity. He understood in retail, if you raise your prices, people tend to react to those changes. And oftentimes they react to them very significantly. That's elasticity at work. So let's take a look at a couple of examples here of elasticity. How do we calculate it? And then what affects elasticity? Elasticity can be found mathematically by taking the percentage change in quantity demanded and dividing that by the percentage change in price. Basically what we're doing is we're looking at how much does percent how much does quantity demanded change when you change price so if price goes from one dollar to two dollars and we have a percentage change in quantity demanded as a result of that we take those two numbers we divide them and we get our elasticity of demand so for example let's say that you have a pizza restaurant and they are putting a sale on let's say there's a 10 percent discount in price. So 10% decrease in price. What happens to quantity demanded? Let's say that after a week of this sale, they, they take a look at their sales and they say, they see that there's been a 20% increase in the quantity demanded. They've sold 20% more pizzas. Well, if we take those two numbers and put them into our equation, we can calculate the elasticity of demand. So we know the percentage change, and I'm going to abbreviate this, abbreviate this as percentage change. Delta is just the Greek symbol that we use for change. So the percentage change in quantity demanded divided by the percentage change in price. We have 20% increase in quantity demanded and we have a 10% decrease in price, which gives us a minus two. Now, minus two is the elasticity, but when we measure elasticity, we will always take the absolute value of that number. Now, it's always gonna be a negative number because quantity demanded and price move in opposite directions. But just to make our analysis simpler, we drop the negative sign. So what does that negative two mean? Well, we actually use that negative two and compare it to a benchmark. Our benchmark is one. One is sometimes referred to as the unit elasticity. Unit elasticity simply means that the percentage change in quantity demanded is equal to the percentage change in price. Uh, let me say PCT. So the percentage change in quantity demanded is equal to the percentage change in price. But if it's not, and it rarely is, then we just use that one as a benchmark. If the elasticity of demand, as we've calculated, if that's greater than one, then we say that demand is elastic. In other words, it is very responsive to a change in price. It's very responsive to a change in price. And you know what? Pizza is very responsive to a change in price because you have so many options, so many other places you could get pizza. Sure, you probably have your favorite, but if they jack up their price, you're probably going to go somewhere else. 
So if elasticity of demand is greater than one, like we just saw, then demand is elastic. Now, what happens if demand is less than one? Well, if that's the case, um, then demand is not elastic anymore. Let's take a look at an example here first. Let's say that you need to have um, insulin. Insulin is a medicine for diabetics. And let's say that the price of insulin goes up. Let's just make it really large. Let's say it increases by 100%. That means that your quantity demanded is probably going to go down. You're not going to use as much. You're not going to buy as much, but you need insulin to live. So it's not going to drop by a lot. Let's say that it only goes down 5%. If we put those numbers into our equation, the percentage change in quantity demanded over the percentage change in price, we have a 5% change in quantity demanded over a 100% change in price, which gives us, again, so this will be negative and this will be positive, this gives us a negative 0 0.05. We take the absolute value of that, and that number is far less than one. In this case, when the elasticity of demand is less than one, we say that demand is inelastic. In other words, people are not responsive, or they are not very responsive to a change in price. You need this thing to live. This is something that is a necessity. You've got to have it. And if the price goes up, if it goes up by a lot, you can't change how much you, you use. You've still got to buy it. This is an, a product with an inelastic demand. Now, some goods we can, we can say with certainty are elastic or inelastic for the vast majority of people. Other goods are not so clearly elastic or inelastic. It depends on the person. So for example, I eat a lot of cereal in the morning. That's the pretty much eat cereal every morning. And the cereal, my cereal of choice are frosted mini wheats. If they raise the price of frosted mini wheats, I'm going to not be real happy about that, but I'm probably still going to buy them. That's my favorite. For other people, if they raise the price of frosted mini wheats, they're going to go elsewhere. So for me, the product might be more inelastic, but for most other people, it's fairly elastic. What I want to wrap up with here is to talk a little bit about what makes a good elastic or inelastic. Probably the most important thing that makes a good elastic or inelastic are the number of substitutes. We can think about this in a slightly different way by saying, or by asking, is the good a necessity or is the good a luxury? If there are very few substitutes, or if the good is a necessity, if it's something you have to have, like insulin we just talked about, then the good tends to be much more inelastic in demand. Insulin, EpiPens, medications, those things, there, there aren't substitutes. You have to have them. And so those goods tend to be much more inelastic in demand. If the price goes up, people don't like it, but they still pay it. However, if you have many options, or if the good is a luxury, you have many alternatives, like with cereal, then the good tends to be more elastic for most people. A really interesting illustration of this, and a really um, a great way of showing what happens when you don't understand elasticity, uh, is the folly of taxing this thing. So a number of years ago now, Congress, in their attempt to try to raise money, sought to tax something specific. We'll talk more about excise taxes in a little bit. But Congress thought, well, what can we tax? 
that people buy that's really expensive. We don't want to tax people who are struggling to get by. Well, let's tax something that the rich people use. And so they settled on taxing yachts. The thing about taxing a yacht is that people who buy yachts have lots of money and they have lots of alternatives for that money. And if the yacht gets too expensive, they just simply say, you know what, I'm not gonna buy a yacht. I could buy all kinds of other things. I can buy a, I can buy a trip on somebody else's yacht. I could buy a new sports car. I could buy a polo pony, who knows? You can buy lots of things with your money. And so what happened after the tax was passed was that the sale of yachts dropped precipitously. Unfortunately, this ended up hurting people who built yachts who tended to not be super rich. And so shortly after the yacht tax was passed, Congress repealed the yacht tax. The rich people went back to buying yachts. The people who were not rich went back to building yachts and everything went back to normal. The problem for Congress was that they didn't understand the concept of elasticity. They didn't understand that when you tax a good that has a very elastic demand, you're not going to make any money. People will just go and buy other things. If you want to tax something that has a, that in order to raise money, you should tax products that have a very ela inelastic demand. Things that people are still going to purchase even if the price goes up. Which is why Congress has chosen so often to tax things like cigarettes and alcohol. Because people buy those almost regardless of the price. So that's one thing that affects elasticity. Actually, the biggest thing that affects elasticity, and that is the availability of substitutes. Another thing that affects elasticity is the percent of your income that you're spending on something. If, you have, if you're spending a very small amount of your income on a product, then the, good, the product tends to have a very inelastic demand because even a big change in the amount of, uh, even a big change in price doesn't affect how much you, you buy because that big percentage change in price is actually just a tiny bit of your income. Think about chewing gum. If you're expecting to spend 35 cents on a pack of chewing gum, or even 50 cents on a pack of chewing gum these days, and you were to go to, you were to, go to check out and you were to find that there was a, say a 20% increase in the price of a pack of cigarette, uh, a pack of chewing gum. In the case of the 35 cent pack, that's a seven cents increase. If the price is 50 cents, that's a dime more. You're gonna to have to pay 10 cents more. That's a big income. That's a big shift in the, in the price. But it's such a small portion of your income. Even college students don't bat an eye at spending seven more cents or 10 more cents on, the, on something. And so you keep buying. You don't change your buying behavior at all. In fact, it's such a small percentage change in terms of your quantity demanded, it may be zero. So there may not be a change at all. When the percentage of your income spent is very small, demand tends to be inelastic. But if it's big, if it's a big portion of your income, even small percentage changes in price can have enormous effects on quantity demanded. Think about tuition. If Robert Morris raises tuition, I don't know, say 2%, you're talking about hundreds of dollars, and that is a big percentage of your income. If Robert Morris were to increase tuition 20%, the same percentage as the pack of chewing gum, well, most of you wouldn't come back because it's a huge portion of your income. So even small percentages, when you're talking about small percentage changes on a large amount of money, that can have significant effects, which means that people change their behavior, change their purchases significantly. That's an elastic demand. The last area that I wanna talk about here is how much time do you have to respond to the change in price? If you just have a tiny amount of time, just a little bit of time to respond to a change in price, then demand tends to be much more inelastic. You don't have time to go find an alternative. But if you have a lot of time, then demand tends to be much more elastic. 
you hear a price, you say, oh, that price is too high, and the seller doesn't budge, you say, well, bugger off, I'm going to find an alternative. I got time, I don't need it right now. And one of those situations might be a tow truck. Let's say that you, uh, you, you are going out with your friends, you found somewhere that's open, and you're going out with your friends, and it's late at night, so you go out to one of the parking lots on campus, and you get in your car, and you turn the key, and nothing happens. It's like, oh, no, something's wrong with my car. So you call up a, a local tow company, and you say, hey, my car is broken down. They ask you where you are, and you tell them you're on the campus at Robert Morris University. And the tow truck driver says, whoa, that's a dangerous place. I don't know if I want to go there late at night. And you pause for a second and say, what, what are you talking about, man? It's not dangerous here at all. And the tow truck driver is like, oh, yes, it is. And in order to get me to come and tow your, tow, tow your car because it's so dangerous and there aren't alternatives at this time of night, it's going to cost you, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to charge you $500. And you say, dude, you know, I can, I can almost see your garage from campus. I could almost push my car down the hill and have it get there. $500 is absolutely ridiculous. And he says, well, you better make a decision because it's getting late. And the later it goes, the more expensive it's going to be. And you just hang up the phone. You say, yeah, I'll call somebody else in the morning. I'm on campus. I have time to react to that change in price. Eh, I'm not going to be able to go out. But I'm not supposed to go out anyway. So I will... Just wait until morning and call somebody else. I'll be able to get something so much cheaper. You have lots of time to react. Now, let's say that um, a different scenario presents itself. Let's say that instead of being broken down on campus, you're driving around Pittsburgh and you see a sign. You're a little bit lost and your phone's dead, so you can't get directions. And you see a sign that says, Welcome to Homewood. Now, Homewood's a part of Pittsburgh that is kind of dangerous at certain points of the day, certain parts of the day. And so um, you don't like this, and you're going to try to find a place to turn around, and the car breaks down. And you think to yourself, ah, this can't be good. Now, fortunately, just as the car's breaking down, your phone starts working again. So you can call a tow truck driver, and you can say, hey, I just broke down. And the truck driver's like, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Where are you? And you say, I'm in Homewood. And the truck driver, there's a pause on the end of the line. And the truck driver says, you know, this is not a good time of day to be in Homewood. It's dark. It's nighttime. Bad things happen in Homewood. And you say, yeah, yeah, I know. How much is it going to be? And the tow truck driver says, it's going to be 500 bucks because this is actually a dangerous situation. And you say, $500? That's so expensive. And you hear the first gunshot go off and you ask the tow truck driver, how soon can you get here? You don't have a lot of time to respond to the change in price. And so you pay it. Demand now is incredibly inelastic. Well, that's elasticity. Elasticity, like I said, has a lot of different applications. You can have elasticity of demand, which is what we've talked about, but you can have elasticity of supply and elasticity of income and cross-price elasticity. There are other forms of elasticity. In fact, any two variables where there's a percentage change and the variables are related to each other, you can calculate an elasticity. But for our purposes, understanding the elasticity of demand is the most important because it's the most common. Well, that gives us a pretty firm foundation on demand and supply. We know what the two things are. We know how they interact with each other to set prices. And we know a little bit about elasticity of demand. So that's a good place to stop for today. And we'll be looking more at demand and supply as we go forward in the class.